Carlos. Hey. We're live. We're live. We're live. Wait, wait. How many shows wait. have we been doing? And how, why is it every time at the beginning we still go, is this on? This is the internet? Yeah, every time. Like, I figure we would get this start going. You, you kind of have your little morning drive time DJ voice that kind of gets it going. I always do. It's right here. It's right here <laughs> waiting. The Food Tech News Show is brought to you by Food Tech, a company that we don't have and doesn't exist. Acme Corporation. Acme Corporation and Food Tech and Tech Industries. And we're coming to you live from Seattle, Washington. Very rainy, which is very like on, you know, brand um, for Seattle. I like it. I like this uh, light drizzly stuff. Um, I like taking walks in it. I do like the sunshine, so I'm going to be bummed around like October, November in this perma, perma rainy, but I, I kind of dig this right now. So for me, and I've said this on the show before, I love the rain. So let's bring on more rain. I'm fine with it. It's been so hot for the summer. Um, but yes, not, enough about the weather. Let's talk about other news, which is food tech news. Yeah. And this first story I've been thinking and writing about the idea of smell a vision probably more than most people, which is a weird thing to think about. And this is a thing that's been, people have been trying to do since the early 1900s. Actually in, in the 1800s, people tried to do it in, in theaters. And in the 1900s, they tried to do it in movie theaters. And essentially this pairing of smell with video entertainment, none of them taken off because it basically worked like crap. But there's a company called Osmo that is working on understanding the world of smells and digitally recording them. And they are building an AI to essentially build out a map of the world of smells. It's led by a, comp, uh, a founder called Alex Wilch, Wilchko. Looks like a, a Russian name. He's a Harvard trained ex Google uh, with a PhD in olfactory neuroscience from Harvard. Like he, he just rolled out of the factory as the perfect person to start a, to start a smell AI company. Mm -hmm. And his, his company's principal odor map was created by their, their model. And apparently this map has outperformed human panelists in predicting the consensus scent of molecules, which makes for a significant advancement in olfactory science and demonstrates that AI can predict smells based on molecular structure. And uh, I think this is, is kind of a fun story. I think uh, I would love to have like a TV I could turn on and watch a movie about like a, and someone walking through a jungle or through a downtown, although. Mm, jungle maybe about. not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I want downtown smells wafting wafting into my living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I tell you one thing. For one it's similar to a story we covered, I think, last week about calorie counting, AI and calorie counting. And there's a lot of research being done around all this food tech stuff. And you always wonder about how is the application gonna work? Right. So they're working on smell vision but how does that enter the workspace and how you know, the living space? How does it get to my TV? How does it go to the movie theaters? What are the companies that are building that thing to produce those smells? So while he's, you know, and they are probably working on a lot of really cool technology around it, I'm all for it. But yeah, how do we deliver it, right? Good question. I think about five years ago, Roku, I think, filed a patent for possibly identifying smells in your house. So it was kind of a reverse smell vision. It essentially Roku? detect if you were... I think it's Roku or maybe TiVo. I think it's one of the two. Huh. And they would detect what you're cooking or what smells are wafting through your house. So if you like to make Indian food or Mexican food, it would detect that and then send a commercial wow. targeted. So it's kind of a bit creepy. You know how you feel like you're talking about things and all of a sudden your your iPhone or your Alexa starts sending you advertisements about a yeah. product you've been talking with your friends about? I feel like this is an even, even creepier idea where they would basically say, hey, this person loves Mexican food. Let's send him some Taco Bell That's weird. advertisements. Yeah. And by the way, that already happens on our phone for sure. Like it, it already happens. Like you're talking about something and it shows up as like an ad mm -hmm. somewhere or on your like, you know, Facebook page. But I will say this, um, that's, that's a creepier version where it's like, you know, listening slash figuring out what you have. I wouldn't want that. I would want kind of what you said earlier is like, I'm watching a movie. Uh, in this kind of age where we watch a lot of stuff on a computer or our phone, it's always fun for me. I think you, we we talked about this too off podcast. Just sit down in front of the TV, the big TV that you paid for, and just watch a movie for a while. You know, just unplug in a way 
and experience this huge thing like Dune or something. And with that, Dune is a good example, the sand, right? Like you can smell the sand a little bit. You can smell the, the you know, the creepy caverns they're in or something. I think that would be amazing. If you've seen the technology that has the lights behind the TV, do you have that yet? No. It's, it's really cool where I don't have it either yet, but I want to install it. It goes behind the TV and it follows what's happening on screen. So if you're in a dark red room in the, in the scary movie, it. it projects it red the on the wall. It sets the Yeah, mood. yeah, yeah. But it follows the, like the entire movie. So if you put that together with smell, man, I'm all in. The trick is creating some sort of technology that can do a multitude of smells rather than just like create, Hey, a single smell of pine or whatever. Cause you think about how, you know, the odor industry is a big one, right? Like you get candles and all these scents that are created artificial scents that go into lots of different things, but to get something that essentially would be a multi smell printing device or, or kind of yeah. device that spits it out in the environment. That's an, that would be difficult, but getting back to this idea of detecting your smells in your house, I thought a lot about, I think uh, Sebastian Rupley wrote an article for us a while ago about this idea of essentially a, mul a multi-sensor that would go into your kitchen that would be able to sense not only sounds, but also what, kind of the humidity and pressure and maybe it just sense mo senses molecules. And as sensors get smarter and you get these multimodal sensors in your home, I think that's probably at some point going to come. One of them obviously could be a smell sensor. And I think it's not out of the, the realm of possibility to say, hey, this person's in a human environment. This person is in a place that smells a lot like tacos or whatever, and then totally start to tailor things in terms of commercials, et cetera, towards that. It's kind of creepy, but I think that's not out of the realm of possibility. And also I wonder like, besides me making a purchase, like what is the upside for me to have that in my home, right? I mean, it's upside for the advertisers is huge. The upside for me as a consumer is what? Yeah. I mean, the advertising aspects are creepy. It'd have to be sponsored or whatever. Maybe Amazon puts it in. Like, I mean, in a sense, I feel like the Amazon shows are kind of like a little bit creepy little sensors that are listening to audio in your house. But I think if you had a smart home multi-sensor in your home that could detect, for example, uh, rapid increases in heat, for example, or, um, you know, certain types of, uh, I don't know, gases, like, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. you have like methane in your house. I don't know, but there's obviously safety ram implications that I think could be tied to smart home. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, th I think there's lots of things you start to think about, Hey, this could be something that could add to like a smart home type of experience and living style. Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like it is part of the words smart home, right? That it makes a lot of sense. Um, I would say that if you put it in your refrigerator, maybe it could like tell you when food goes bad. You're like, hey, listen, you got some bad eggs in there. Better get them out of there. Um, or those dishes in the back. You know, we always, always have that one dish. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and there, there are smart refrigerators. I know Amazon has a patent on one that essentially is putting a, a, a gas sensor in your house, in your, oh, your fridge. It? And a lot of it is gases emit from food that expires, and they could kind of detect where it is in the life cycle. So I think that's that's one well, obvious application. I haven't really seen a commercial rollout of that. There's been a couple I know, of companies I was trying trying to create essentially what are next generation um, food storage devices. We've seen but a lot of fridges I, at all these shows and I've never seen that fridge yet. Right. So. Yeah. Mostly ones with cameras. If you're going to get any sort of sensors, a vision yeah. sensor, but. Before we leave this story though, I, I was reminded of when I looked at it about the stickers. Do you remember the scratch off stickers that you would mm -hmm. smell? And us who yeah. are older, um, you know, the younger people might not know, but like it was a huge deal. And I even had a sticker book, which is so weird to me now to think about that, where I collected stickers. Um, I guess it's kind of cool now, actually. And a lot of those stickers that I collected were scratch and sniff and they lasted forever. Yeah. And I remember I like pizza and root beer and I would just be like smelling it. And they smell great. There they was do. a John Waters. I think it was John Waters had a movie, I think in the eighties where he essentially created a movie and had a strip essentially a scratch a sniff and so it, it actually guided you when to scratch uh during what scene to scratch and you could get the smells of the uh, different yeah. scenes very kind of <laughs> old school scratch and sniff but i think it was a kind of fun experiment it seems like a john waters thing to do it is i remember hearing about that and also we, we didn't talk about it but a lot of the stuff like you said in the 30s and even in the 60s they built things into helmets 
they tried a lot of stuff uh, before. So it never made it to the consumer market for maybe for a reason. And so that's a question, but. I do think like digital reproduction of smells would be an amazing addition to the world of VR. Imagine yeah. being in an immersive experience in a, in a virtual reality headset, and then you're in a certain city and you're walking down the street and as you pass these restaurants or whatever, I think you could just imagine how immersive that would be. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Very cool. Next story is, uh, how would you like a nice glass of 2D printed oatmeal, Carlos? Is that sound, something like you'd like to have a, a glass of? Yes, because I have oat milk every day on my mocha, so. Well, now you can possibly get it shipped to you in essentially oat milk strips. Milkadamia, known for their macadamia-based milks, announced their first oat milk this week. And it isn't just any oat milk. It's actually oat milk that is 2D printed on strips. And they're calling it their uh, flat pack oat milk. Essentially, it is uh, milk paste printed onto flat sheets using a proprietary 2D printing process. And then each sheet can be put into water that soaks overnight. In the morning, you have a glass of milk. Or you can instantly blend it and have an instant beverage. And so... It sounds kind of weird. You might ask why they're doing it, but I think in terms of if you know how how much car CO2 is emitted, how much plastic waste there is around bottled beverages, hmm. I think this makes a lot of sense. I have a bunch of questions. One, I don't like the words milk paste. That <laughs> that bothers me. Just like, a, you know, certain people don't like certain words. That one I don't like. Um, secondly, yeah, the, the use case is confusing to me. So I buy oat milk in those, mm -hmm. you know, cardboard containers or whatever, like Oatly. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what the waste is there, what the, you know, uh, issues are with that packaging, but it seems pretty efficient. And that thing lasts forever, right? Like it's on the shelf when you buy it, you know, yeah. you don't have, you have to refrigerate it. So I feel like I'm, what are they helping me with? with well, this? they claim that it reduces the CO2 footprint by 92% and it reduces the packaging waste of 85%. And I think hmm. you don't think about the, the CO2 and the environmental impact of beverages nearly as much as you do of meat, but beverages, liquids just waste so much. So you have to haul these things from the factory. You're, you're doing it in big trucks then you haul it from the, you know, the grocery store to your house. And it just is a lot of, moving stuff around. And then, you know, if you're moving just beyond milk, let's just talk about beverages. Like there's all this plastic waste for bottled water, et cetera. So I do think the beverage industry has a huge environmental impact. And so I think that's what they're thinking. They're just trying to think of innovative ways to basically let people make it at their home because yeah. everyone has running water. Everyone has tap water. So why wouldn't you just essentially deliver the, the concentrated version of oat milk to your house and you can make it at home? The only way I'd do it, though, is with a blender because I'm not putting anything in my refrigerator overnight. Come on. Come on. This, <laughs> we, this is an immediate, uh, you know, modern society where we need things right away. And I wake up in the morning, I'm going to make a mocha, but I didn't put the stuff in last night. It's never going to happen. So it had to be, yeah, I put it in my blender with like my own coffee or something. Maybe. I, they, what they need Maybe. to do is sell it to Starbucks. Yeah. Right? I mean, if they could do it in large quantities um, to do it in those in the stores, are you thinking more like, hey, this could be a Starbucks product you buy? No, I meant like they could do it like they could use that to save all that stuff on the waste yeah. or whatever. They could just be like, hey, Starbucks, you no longer get the like containers. You just get these little sticks that you have to put in a blender first or something. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I mean, there already is oat milk powder. And there's obviously mm. a lot of like constant concentrated concentrates and, and powders to make drinks at home. So that's the one thing I was wondering about why 2d printed strip of oat paste. When yeah. You could basically say, Hey, you could send me a little scoopable powder to make my oat milk. I've seen that at Costco. Yeah. Um, and, and we we've all bought an energy drink. I buy these hydration packs where you could basically put hydration powder into your glass of water and then you make it. So a lot of us are already, mixing little beverages at home. I True. just wonder why they decided to do the strips. Yeah. Protein shake. I got all that powder. That's how I do it. So interesting. Milkadamia, Milkadamia isn't the first company. There's a company called Vegans out of Europe that got a patent on this. There's also a company called Smart Cups with that prints their drinks, but they do energy drinks and they print the concentrates directly into the bottom of a cup. So you have a little cup, you put some water in it and you have an energy drink. 
And apparently the cup is really environmentally friendly, even though it's disposable. It, it's like made from, uh, I think, plants, plant-based materials, et cetera, and it's fully compostable. But this is not an entirely original thing to Milkodamia. I just thought it was interesting because they are a pretty big brand name in plant-based milk. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Moving on to the next story. This is a smart kitchen, kitchen tech story, long and well-known startup in the space of Nova, now owned by Swedish conglomerate Electrolux. They um, really, I think, were the biggest winner in the sous vide circulator market. Uh, they And they were acquired by uh, Electrolux, I think, in like 2019 or something like that, 2018. Anyway, they... They... And there's been a lot of, one of the criticisms I think of, of kitchen tech and just connected devices in general this, is this idea of hey, what happens when the app stops working? If like an app is central to the experience or what if they start to change the monetization models and you bought a piece of hardware with an app that works with it and all of a sudden years later they decide to charge a subscription fee. Well, that's what Innova is doing. They announced, the CEO of the company announced that they will start charging a subscription fee for the app for the Anova sous vide circulators, the previous generation. And uh, Steve Savagin, the CEO, says that the decision to do this was based on the fact that each connected cook costs them money. Mm. The cost that gets pretty significant when they say that they've done hundreds of millions of cooks, which seems like a lot to me. I think they've probably done a total of hundreds of millions of cooks. I don't think all, all these people are using their app. I know I have an Anova circulator. I just stick it in a big thing of water. I don't even, I haven't used the app forever. Mm. And I just, I just hit go on it. I imagine most people do that. The new subscription is $1.99 per month or $10 a year. And so a lot of people weren't happy about this, Carlos. A lot of people were complaining online on, on the blog post as well as Reddit. One person said, um, I like the product, bought it for friends and family as a gift. I will no longer be using this product. I regret ever supporting this company. Another person said, you've watched Sonos app troubles and thought, hey, hold on, hold my beer. Charging your customers for your inability to innovate is a doozy. Obviously, liking it, liking it to uh, the Sonos issues with their app. But what do you think? If you had a sous vide circulator, would you be? Would you feel betrayed? I think, yeah, I think it's more about because it's not that expensive. Just to be truthful, like that was it ten dollars a year? Come on, yeah, it's not. I much. pay a lot more than that for Netflix and other things, which I know are giving me different types of entertainment. But so I don't think it's the money. It's just the yeah, the kind of whoops, look over here and we're doing this over here. And people never like that. Secondly, people online love to hate things. So there's a little bit of that going on when I read some of those comments. It's like, yeah, just calm down. Like it's it's a, not a cool thing to do, but at the same time, it's not the end of the world. So I don't know. I don't think it's the price point. I think it's more of like you said, like I don't have that device, but if I had something like that, I would literally just turn it on, put it in the water, never even like go near my phone. Um, I like the fact that it is the technology in just a device, you know, and I think maybe that's a ton of people bought it for that and they weren't really thinking about that, mixing it together yeah. with the app. Yeah. And I think it's like, I don't know if you remember, but the chef steps jewel sous vide circulator was app only control. Like you needed mm. the app to make it work. And part of the reason I think people like the Nova was the fact that you can actually just use the physical controls yep. on the device. So it would be a completely different reaction uh, i think if if, uh, if chef step said hey we're going to charge you for this app i think it's i think you're right it's a, it's a vocal minority a lot of people complaining online but i don't i don't know at the end of the day it's a big deal but i just do think it speaks to the fact that hey you know we're we're used to apple and smartphone companies like forcing us to upgrade and then they eventually end up life stuff when they just feel like hey we need to start putting our attention on the latest generation of product what with appliances, I feel like people think these things last forever. So I think like this is a Nova saying, hey, we're going to try a more smartphone-based approach, like a, like a, a, a technology product approach versus like a cooking gadget approach, because I think most people expect their cooking gadgets to go on forever. I think this also brings up an interesting point that I just thought of, which is I wonder if humans are like as technology gets better and more embedded which we've seen every year at CES and SKS and all the different shows um, is, is do we want, do we start wanting the technology just in the appliance and not to ever have to go back to our phones? Like, is that transition happening now? Um, because I know for me, I'm exhausted of the, with the phone. Like 
and as we look at glasses and as we look at other things that are wearables and things that we don't need to have to just be going back to the phone, we can just do it all within whatever, you know, device we have. Maybe people are thinking of a little bit more like that. Hey, my refrigerator is smart. Never have it talk to my phone. You know, just let me do it all there. Like the Jetsons. I don't know. Maybe that's yeah, the transition yeah. point. I mean, another part of the story is they're also going to stop supporting Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for these older models. And one of the use cases around that is if you have a sous vide circulator and you're, say, running home from work or you're, you run to the store, you can actually remotely turn on your sous vide circulator and initiate a cook or turn it off. That I think is a, a, a thing that is only possible through your phone and your apps. Mm -hmm. I think there are some feature sets. Another idea would be like a refrigerator with a camera in it. And you can't remember if you have milk while you're at the grocery store, you can look at your phone. So I do think there's applications that where benefits come through connectivity and through apps. But I, I think you're right for a lot of people for basic functionality, they don't need that. Yeah, it depends on the what you're you're using the device for. Like if it's just like straight cooking, the refrigerator and the yeah, talking to your phone. But again, in the future, that will probably just be your glasses. You'll be like, what do I have at my what's in the fridge? <laughs> That's how you do it. Last story of the day is about a new robot. I throw I needed to throw a robot in here. Yeah. Last story in here for Carlos. There's a new humanoid robot out of China called the S1 robot launched by Starbucks, Star, Starbucks, not Starbucks, not Stardust Starbucks. Intelligence. Well, I'm, I'm all in if it's a Starbucks robot. It's Stardust Intelligence, and they've made a robot with a human-like upper body structure mounted on a wheel base. And there's a video, I don't know if you got a chance to watch a video. Mm -hmm. It sees the robot giving cat food to a cat and serving tea in a cup. And it can uh, play musical instruments as well. Like, it seems like it does a lot of things. Every time, you know, we every month or so, we see a new humanoid robot, it seems, popping up. That is, and every time in the videos, they're doing something with food. Yeah. So this one definitely seems like it could be interesting if we're looking at that humanoid robot that works around the house, makes us a cup of tea. What do you think? Yeah, it was making waffles and coffee. I'm all in. Are you kidding me? That's a perfect morning. The robot is making coffee and waffles and just gives it to me and I wake up and it's there. Um, again, it's always the footprint of the robot. Like in my little teeny studio apartment, uh, it's not happening. You know what I mean? Even though it has a wheel base, which is nice and easier to move around. Um, it's, it's going like five feet before it hits something or two feet. So yeah, it's just, again, how do you, how do you make it cost efficient? How do you have it move around a house and not just fall over? Um, I don't know. I, I want this thing. You know, I watched Sunny, the show Sunny. I want that robot. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, I don't know how it happens. I don't know when we get there cost wise and just like functionality wise. Like this thing was jumping around and doing all these cool things. But like, can it do that in houses? Like, what is its proximity it was doing, thingy? It was doing Kung Fu. Like, it could be your Kung home Fu, defense yeah. robot and then serve you a meal right after it beats up uh, the, the, the perpetrator. So. I Wait, wait, will you have Actually, one? Wanna... Do you really, dude, do you want one? If it worked that well, it depends what the cost is. But, uh, I mean, I am watching Sunny too, so it's a little bit creepy, this idea of like a human and a robot. But I do think it'd be fun to have one. Yeah, I just, I, we never talked about if you would actually say yes. It sounds like better all... than the Apple, the Apple one that's essentially is an iPad standing on a table. It sounds yeah, like an it's iPad on a table is something that. we can already have. Um no, this is cool. I, said I mean, this, I, I said this was the last story, but um, I want to move on to a new story real quickly. Okay. I want to get your opinion. Did you see <laughs> that Chick-fil-A is announcing a streaming service? I did not see this at all. Yeah, they've been roundly what? mocked. Like Chick-fil-A is essentially announced that they're going to be doing a streaming service for family friendly, mostly unscripted original shows. And they're in talks to acquire and license content. Um, they're talking about doing game shows and, and reality TV shows. And uh, it, it just sounded like it, it, it's gotten so roundly talked about and kind of mocked online. I think And what was funny is some of the, the, the its competitors, their social media accounts have just gone made hay with this. It's been pretty funny them getting mocked by it. So anyway, I just thought it was such a weird thing. Like... Uh, a food company, a fast food company is talking about doing a streaming company, a streaming service. It is very weird. Now, 
I'm when you said family friendly, I'm a little confused. Now Chick Fil A is owned by what is it again? I think they're similar to Hobby Lobby in that they have, I think, uh, essentially Christian based owners. So I think that you know they are closed on Sundays, so they do. Yeah, have they kind of present as a family values. Christian centric organization. So I, for some reason they think that they also now have to do Christian content. I think they're always family. That's what, that's what I was getting at. That was what I was getting at. Yeah. That's the, uh, the low hanging fruit there, the elephant in the room. Um, yeah, they just want to maybe promote more of their message. Uh, and they're going to do that through streaming. I mean, I don't know. It, it does seem like people love the sandwiches. The sandwiches are good. Like a, the brand has been growing a lot. Does that then make you, Maybe there's some ways to cross promote. You buy a sandwich, you get a month free <laughs> of like your subscription or whatever. Oh yeah. You know, I'm like the, you know, there's probably these cross promotions you can do. I think like an obvious thing is to do content about like inside Chick-fil-A, like, Hey, here's the life of a Chick-fil-A worker. That'd actually be kind of interesting. I would probably watch that. I'm just wondering if I'm a, why Chick-fil-A needs to, feels like they need to do a full streaming service. It's very weird. I, by the way, that documentary on Chick Fil A could just be on YouTube, so I don't need to pay a streaming service for that. Um, I can't. I don't want any family friendly. Sorry, I don't have a family at this point, and I'm not looking for family friendly content that I would pay for in a streaming service. And if they just do deals with other companies, that content's everywhere else. So I don't know why they would do this. It's weird to me. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. So you're not going to be subscribing. You will I'm not be subscribing. buying sandwiches. I'll, I'll, I'll have the gonna... sandwiches. But what if you get a month free with your, your chicken sandwich? I'll take it, I guess. What do you want me to do? Can take not take a free thing? I'll take it and then I'll not subscribe at the end of the month, you know. All right. All right. I just now you now I want Chick-fil-A though. I know I just said like, you know, maybe I don't need their family friendly service, but I definitely like their sandwiches. Mm. Little pickles Those on sandwiches. them. Mm. I feel like they're overrated. I feel like they're overrated. They're good. That's I, I didn't say they're great, but I like but I they, really like them. Well, they just came to Washington State, I think, a couple years ago, and the lines are ridiculously long. Yeah, and I'm, I, I just didn't get the excitement because I, I went and had one, and it seemed like it was like this warmed over chicken sandwich it wasn't special. Warmed wasn't special over, you got a bad one. Now, I this mean, compared to like Kentucky Fried or or like even like McDonald's, I don't know if it's much better. Popeyes too. Do we have? I think we have one or two Popeyes, not too many of them. I don't think, but yeah, I think. Um, Maybe we don't have any Popeyes, but I like the spicy chicken sandwich with the pickles. Mm, I'll eat that any day of the week, as long as it's fresh. I, you know, you got a bad one, maybe. Um, and again, it's not a great sandwich, but it's very good. And I'd put it alongside anything else I would get from fast food. Okay. But yeah. Right. Anyways, this has been the Chick-fil-A review. Yeah, this Chick-fil-A review. And that's Mark's the end of our podcast. And uh, any, anything else, Carlos, any final parting words? Yes, please. Everybody go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. We have tons of videos, new shorts, podcast clips from a podcast like this one right here you're listening to or watching. And you can get little snippets. You don't have to watch the whole thing if you don't want to. You can just little get a little clip of, of Mike saying something funny or me saying something maybe funny. <laughs> and then also go to our Twitter. We still are on Twitter slash X, uh, Instagram, and... Uh, where else? TikTok. So check us out on those social channels, please. TikTok. And uh, we're we're not on Friendster anymore. We're not on Friendster or MySpace, but we might be going back to MySpace. I'm gonna make it happen. All right. All right. Thanks, Carlos. All right. Thanks. Bye.